Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all across Canada. My name is Christopher Brown, and I'm your host. Over the course of this show, we will be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone who lives there. Today, we are honored to have our guest onto the show. Please help me welcome Mayor Tony Stidell of the Village of Duchess in the province of Alberta. Tony, welcome to the show. Pleased to meet you, and uh, thank you very much. So, Tony, let's start with the million-dollar question that I start all my interviews off with, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? I just uh, just wanted to see how uh, municipal politics worked, and uh, I decided to throw my hat in the ring in 2001. So prior to 2001, had you had any interest of getting involved in municipal politics or even po politics in general? Or what was the big thing that finally said, OK, Tony needs to learn more about municipal politics and this is the election to do that? And basically, basically, it was just I wanted to uh, see how, how everything worked in politics and uh I just thought it would be a great time to try it. Uh, I know my job uh, kind of thought I thought my job might hinder it a little bit, but uh, it turned out that it was okay. It uh, just happened to be that our meetings were at the right time, and I, in the first nine years that I was on council, I had only missed about uh, eight meetings due to work. And uh, that was including working overseas and everything. Okay, so let let's let's dive into the reason behind municipal politics. That's the crux of this show: is trying to figure out why people chose municipal politics. You could have chosen federal, you could have chosen provincial, but in two thousand one, as you just stated, you wanted to learn more about municipal politics. Most people would go out and learn before running an election, but you decided to jump in uh, head first in two thousand one. What was it about that? community draw of municipal politics for you that kind of wanted you to get more engaged but more informed of what it was all about it was just just uh you know hearing people talk and different things and uh talking about other uh, municipal council and i just thought it would be a great time to try it it uh just, what have you learned? What, what have you learned since 2001 that has made you a better politician? And I, I know sometimes that's a nasty word in municipal government, but uh, made you a better person, made you a better counselor, made, made you a better mayor at the time as well. Uh, just listening to people, their uh, wants and their needs. And uh, I just wanted to see if we could uh, change anything that, uh, problems that people were asked or the questions people were asking and uh just basically to see how it worked at the start were there more micro issues or macro issues were there more issues about the village in general or was it about health care education and in previous elections like the most recent one in 2021 are some of those issues still around because you're still trying to grow and trying to move this uh, the village forward? No, I think it, I, there was no real pressing issues from anybody. Oh. Uh, but over the years, over the years, I uh, just learned to, I learned so much about politics or uh, municipal politics, and uh, after the first term. I just thought, well, I learned a little bit, and uh, I learned that my voice did have a little bit of uh, clout behind it in the village, and uh, obviously the people like me. Uh, I've been on council for a total of 22 years now. It'll be 24 years at the end of this term, and uh, I just enjoyed it, uh, meeting people, from all over Alberta, it just, it's been a real pleasure to be in politics. So you've seen the village grow. You've seen the village change in the last 22 years since you first got elected to council. 
I want to talk about that transformation from your perspective. You you continue to serve, you continue to get voted on because people think you're doing a good job. How has the village changed from that first election when you ran in 2001 to now? Have you Has it changed drastically? Has there been minor changes? Or what do you see as the biggest change that has happened over the last 22 years in the village of Duchess? Well, I guess uh, when I first got elected in, we, I think the village was about 500 people. And now it is... Uh, the last census was 1,052. And, uh, you know, people were bringing concerns. They wanted more facilities. They wanted uh, recreation. And uh, just other things to do. And what we have done is over the, over the past 22 years, we have, like I say, we've grown to 20, uh, 000, over 1,000 people. We have... Uh, put enough money aside that uh, we have no debt and about 10 years ago our uh, arena or our soccer center burnt down so I had made a promise to the kids at school because they asked me if we were going to have another building and I promised them we would and about three years later we built uh, about a three million dollar soccer pitch with uh, volleyball court uh, uh, pickleball has got into it now it is we've been a, there's a big uh, fitness room in it and just about all the equipment you can have and at the same time the uh, the lot that it was on when it burnt down it was not big enough for the new arena or new rec center so we acquired a little bit of land from the Ag Society, and uh, in turn, we also paved all the parking lot around our hall, which belonged, and curling rink, which belonged to the Ag Society, and uh, we put in a couple uh, playground areas for the children, and uh, we put in a new couple new subdivisions. The one I live in, it was... Uh, just a small one to begin with. And since then we did two extensions to this one. And uh, we did another one. And I think there was about 20 lots, 25 lots. And we only have about four lots left. And we have another develop, developer that has come in and they, they've got a quite a big uh, area. And there is, I'm going to say, there's got to be about 25 to 30 houses in that one. But we're always trying to expand. Ex expand. Um, our village is a bedroom community to the city of Brooks. And uh, most people work out of the village. And we have built, uh, about five years ago, we built a new municipal office as we were in an old, used to be a shop that we took one bay and converted it into an office area. Uh, our council chambers was upstairs and it was a very, very small room. And uh, we have five councillors and it was very hard to get around the table even to go sit at either end of the table or at the sides. Now, so we've, I, we've done... The, I don't I don't want to interrupt because I, I you have you have grown and I, I was yes. I was kind of fascinated when I was trying to do a little bit of research on the village. You have grown at a substantial rate over 20 years. Doubling your population is a massive endeavor, even for a small community like Duchess. Um are you guys aiming to be a town here soon? Like, is that in the future cards where you are hoping? Because I can imagine you want to continue to grow. You want to continue to add new facilities, add new developments, whether it be subdivisions or lots, but you can't be a village forever. Can you, or are you happy just the way you guys are as a village of the Duchess? Well, right now, right now, uh, I've, I've, I've thought about going into uh, turning into going into a town, but I don't know. I just, 
there's is there appetite things. from the residents to do it? Not really. We're okay. we're like I say, we're a bedroom community. We're small, and you know most people know everybody. <laughs> and we have we have uh, a couple garages here. We have a. Uh, I think it's three rest or two restaurants. Uh, we have a pharmacy that uh, uh, a couple come and talk to them, uh, the girls at the office, and uh, they thought they asked what they what we thought of, of a pharmacy coming into town, and uh, just happened to be that my wife works at the village office, and she said to the people that she thought it'd be a great idea, and. Uh, Shortly right after that, uh, they came into town. I changed my prescriptions and everything over to them, and so did most of the people in the village. We have uh, an outlying population across the river, and quite often it takes uh, quite a bit of time to get your prescriptions filled. And they all changed over uh, to our pharmacy, to the new pharmacy here. And uh, they go in there, and like five minutes, you're out of there. Oh, so wow. it's really been beneficial to us. Um, we've got a convenience store, and uh, South Country Co-op put a card lock serv uh, service station or a station in the village, which has really helped a lot. And uh, I know that the consumption here of fuel and stuff is quite large because I was on the South Country Co-op board for three years. I just resigned because it was just, I just wanted to start cutting back and uh, it was a very good board to be on. But uh, yeah, no, they've opened a building here where they uh, store all their oils and uh, their urea that is stored in, in the village here. Uh, we have a trucking firm, uh, gravel hauling firm here. So it's just been, been it's been exciting because at one time the roads were a lot of the roads weren't paved and we have all our roads paved now we have uh, uh, expanded our water treat our sewage treatment plant okay. our sewage treatment uh, we built a new lagoon uh, in the time we have, joined the regional water from Brooks, which is at first we were very apprehensive of doing it. And uh, because we had our own water treatment plant and it uh, actually in, in the end, it turned out that it was a good thing that we did it. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, I, I want to ask a question about your role as mayor, because if I'm not mistaken and correct me if I'm wrong, um, since I believe 2000, I want to say 2007 or 2010, uh, the village elects only councillors and then the council votes for the mayor position, right? That's correct. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that I got that before I asked this question. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I want to know from you, how much duty and responsibility do you put on your shoulders to make sure the issues that are presented in front of council, the issues that are brought forward to council, help move the village forward at all times. Because I can imagine there are probably issues that your village deals with on a regular basis that aren't pressing. They are more administration than governance. And you have to decide which one goes to council and which one administration can handle. How much of a responsibility do you put on yourself to make sure what gov what the mayor, what council is voting on is truly what needs to be voted on? Uh, I probably put quite a bit on myself. Uh, I have, uh, for the best part, or most part, I've had a very good council that backs me. And uh, if I can I listen to what they say, what they have to say, what issues are coming in, because they come in through our CAO, of course. And uh, we just sit down and we talk very reasonable that, uh, and see what we can do for these issues that are brought up. 
And do you do you find yourself res- respectfully asking questions that need to be asked? Because I can imagine in a small town, everyone knows who you are. You can't go to the pharmacy without no- people not knowing who the mayor is or who you are. H- how much respect do you put on that ability to have people come up to you and say, hey, Tony, I have an issue. I need to talk about this issue. We need to sit down and have this conversation because it's the most important issue, whether it be a pothole, whether it be land use bylaw, whether it be planning, whether it be this, that, or the other. How much respect do you put on yourself to make sure that when you're out in the community and someone approaches you, you listen to everyone and their concerns, even if you agree with them or don't agree with them? I. I do listen to all the concerns that come in. And then I, of course, we have to weigh them, which ones are are relevant and which ones aren't. Uh, I know. Is that hard? I, I, I have to ask, is that hard? Because I can imagine you, you think you know what is relevant and what is not, but I can imagine the residents who have these issues believe theirs is the most relevant issue. So is it hard to, try to weed through what is really relevant and what is something that can be dealt with other ways than the government's intervention? Uh, yes, that <laughs> the million dollar example, question. It, it is uh, one, I guess one example is that uh, let's say you have barking dogs. And the first thing that's that, an know, issue in Duchess. What are you talking about? You that's asked, not an issue in Alberta. Come on. <laughs> I think that's an issue all over. But, uh, you know, we just the, one of the first things we'll ask them or I ask them or the office asks them if it comes into the office is have you talked to your neighbors? And to me, that's a, a good starting point. If they're if they haven't talked to their neighbors, well, they should just talk to them and just say, you know, your dogs are a little loud, uh, you know, at different times of the day or night. And I mean, you gotta, I think that has some, sometimes it has to be worked out between neighbors. And then if not, uh, you know, then we have our CPOs that we pass it on to and they'll go talk to the residents. And hopefully we can get things resolved without having a battle are people willing to hear those are people willing to hear those other alternative uh, methods to trying to solve their issues whether you in this example with the dogs barking as mayor or as the town office or the village office saying have you talked to your neighbor are people willing to uh uh hear that out and actually take that or are they more shoot first and ask questions later type of mentality of I've come to you. I've I, I've come to ask for the mayor's interjection into this issue, so I need it fixed. Are people willing to be calm and cool and collective when it comes to issues where you, as mayor or council, say, "Let's see if we can fix this another way without council getting involved every single time"? I think in in the uh, biggest part of it, things like that work. Uh, like. <laughs> I think you have to be transparent with it, and people, people understand. Most people understand that. I mean, there is <laughs> there is always an issue once in a while that uh, say it know, ain't so, Tony. Person. Say it ain't so. <laughs> I think I think every municipality has the same problem. <laughs> um, and continue. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, and it just. You know, there's a lot of things. I mean, in regard to taxes, I mean, we've been we've been pretty lucky that uh, we've been a very fiscal uh, councils, and that's this has been on prior to me being on council, being a small town that we only have the only income. Most of the the biggest portion of our income is from residents. I mean, because we don't have a lot of commercial. And you just have to be fiscally responsible. And I think it, uh, I think it's worked over the years. Uh, has it been harder? Days. Has Sorry. Has it been harder to be fiscally responsible in the last few years? Because uh, 
it, it, I, I'm not bursting any bubbles right now, Tony, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot here, but cost of doing business has gone up. Cost of doing uh, infrastructure projects has gone up. The cost of living has gone up. You are seeing this firsthand as mayor of a small community. You are seeing this firsthand when you deal with a budget that has to be passed and sets the tax rate for houses. Is it hard to continue to try and grow the community while being cautious of what your residents and your tax base can potentially afford, whether it be a 1%, heck, even if it's a 0.1% increase, some people might find that challenging in this time, in this age. Is it hard to be fiscally responsible and fiscally, uh, I shouldn't say fiscally responsible, but fiscally uh, prudent with the money that the village has to spend every year, particularly in tough years like now? Yes, it has been, absolutely, it's been a lot harder. I mean, like you mentioned, everything going up, the cost of fuel and stuff. Uh, one couple things that we have done, or one thing that we have done, I'm not sure it'd be nine or ten years ago, um, we needed a new garbage truck. And the old one we had was, the guys had to get out of it and throw the garbage into it and everything. So we kind of bit the bullet. We were able to find a good... Um, Dem demonstrator uh, that picks the bins up and uh, we started with that and we have two other municipalities that would do that we do their garbage pickup for uh, so with what we earned from that it has turned around and after seven years of our first truck we we're able to buy another truck outright Oh wow! And we also we also have to put some money into it, uh, obviously. And it has worked very well. Like we're on our second truck now. Uh, all our residents, of course, we give them the garbage bins. We did not charge them for it. The other uh, res, uh, the other municipalities that would do it for, they had to the residents had to pay for the garbage bins, but it has worked very well. Uh, and, you know, we've tried doing it with more and it's just that the timing isn't right yet. And little things like that. Uh, with this new truck that we have now, uh, the fuel consumption is a lot better on it or a lot less. Uh, just a few things about it that are a lot better. They, you know, on the old one, we had to replace tires once, about, about once a year on the back just because going into some of the municipalities we do for, uh, they have cul-de-sacs and the tight turns and the wheels skid. Well, the new truck is a little better equipped because we could afford a better truck. And of course, the rate went up, a lot of the, not the rate, but the uh, cost of it went up substantially. But it's been working out very well. But uh, we have... He you you try to you try not to put that on the back of the taxpayers you, 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 i i love when you said you work collaboratively with two other municipalities in the area and you're able to grow your services that you provide by working collaboratively with other municipalities whether it be that garbage pickup in the example that you've given how important is it for uh, you as mayor and council to find alternative sources of revenue so not everything is on the backs of the taxpayer? It's very important. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm, I'm setting you up for all the easy questions, but these are the questions that I don't think people actually think about when they think about municipal government. Because you're telling me right here, right now, you work with two other municipalities and it was a benefit benefit to you and your village to be able to go buy a better tr a garbage truck and i know garbage is not the sexy issue that people want to talk about but it's an issue that you deal with probably on a regular basis in your community <laughs> well every, every day because i'm also the uh chair of our of uh, we have a regional landfill here for the whole county uh there's five municipalities in it now uh two villages, one town, the city, and of course the uh, county itself, County of Newell. 
and uh, we have a landfill that we've been able to keep uh, the rates very low. Like our, I I look at uh, I have children that live in Strathmore, and I look at their water bills and. Uh, utility bills and they're compared to ours they're outrageous like ours in the winter time they average about 150 to 160 dollars every two months and we just we haven't had to put them up any i mean there's what? i guess we have tweaked them a little bit but uh it's still it's very to me it's a very affordable rate where I should. I, I don't want to say the city, but or the. Oh, trust me. I, I I know the city of Calgary because I get the bill every month, and I'm the one in charge <laughs> of paying that bill. It's not affordable, yeah. man. <laughs> <laughs> and like the, where my two of my children or two of our children live, theirs is like three hundred fifty dollars a month, <laughs> which is outrageous, and. Like I feel We've like that's like their... an Olympic size Olympic size swimming pool that they've been using if they're paying three hundred bucks a month, but some municipalities do that, right? Well, and ours with our with our water, if you use, I'm just going to use an example: thirty cubes of water. We don't charge thirty cubes of water that's going down the sewer. We just have a flat rate of our for our sewer, oh, so we okay. don't charge anything that goes into the into the sewer. It's something that has we've never done, and hopefully we never have to do it. Uh, but it's have, one of the. You know, go ahead. We've we paved all our roads in town. And uh, I, I know we have a half a billion dollar one to do this year because of uh, groundwater underneath it is breaking it up. And we've tried a couple fixes on the corners. Uh, we put in uh, concrete. Part of it is a concrete, which has helped. But the water that's coming up from underneath is the issue. So this year we have to put in uh, storm sewer along that one street. And that's... Five hundred thousand dollars is a big hit. Um, and I correct me if I'm wrong here, Mayor, but I'm assuming that's not the only hit you've received over the last few months. Please correct me if I'm wrong here, but the village is under RCMP, right? But you don't get that bill that the 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 uh, back pay bill, but you just got a bill from the RCMP if you're uh, under RCMP jurisdiction, correct? That's correct. And I think it was two years ago or three years ago when they come out with this, or two years ago when they come out with the retroactive pay. I mean, when they, when we got hit with a, I think it was about a thirty thousand dollar bill, and it's up to sixty thousand dollars in the last couple of years now, and that is pretty hard to swallow, especially when you know when we're funding other things like the egg society, we fund money for the egg society. And it it makes it tough. Uh, we're hopefully that uh, we can get this corrected. We have uh, we pay for two peace officers. We just have them uh, so many hours a month, and they continually do patrols out here. And the RCMP they've. They've started doing a lot more patrols because not so much in Duchess here, but crime has gone up all over. And it is due, I think, just because people can't afford anything anymore. So the crime has gone up. We don't normally have too much crime here. But the RCMP, they come out about every three months and just come out to our one of our council meetings and tell <coughs> excuse me tell uh let us know what ha what they've investigated in Dutchess and what they haven't but overall 
you mind me asking what what the biggest issue is and what the biggest issue RCMP is dealing with? Is it just petty crime or is it breaking enters? Do you mind? And I and I I don't don't answer this question if you don't want to because I never want to put a bad taint to any community because I think every community is a great community to live in. I just I find it a fascinating story because you're the very first mayor to be able to openly say this to me, and I, I I've been wondering why, but I'm just wondering. From your perspective, what are the major issues that the RCMP is dealing with right now in Duchess? Uh, I guess it would be just basically speeding more so. Okay. Uh, the peace officers, they, they, they sit, they come out and they sit close to the schools and to the rec recreation facilities. And that's probably more, yeah, I, I, I don't know what the RCMP find after they stop somebody for a stop sign violation or loud exhaust or whatever. If they, they do, they do find sometimes other things that are happy, you know, that. Yeah. Aren't right. And I don't want to go into it too much. No, but... no. But so I'm going to, I'm going <sighs> to change up a little bit of a, uh, I'm going to change our uh, direction of a conversation here now. And because I am cautious of time, because I just realized we're at the half hour mark already, and I want to make wow. sure I get. I know th th that's the great thing about these shows. We it's just a conversation. You never know how long things pass. But I want to turn to the the village as a whole, and I know we've been talking about it a little bit, but I want to go more uh, focused right now, and I want to know from you as the mayor of the village. In your opinion, not a motion of council, not a direction of council, but your opinion, what is the biggest issue as of recording this episode facing the village of Duchess? Ooh, that's a tough one. <laughs> or issues, or issues, issue or issues. And you can name one or two. I just want to know what, what you see as the biggest hurdle that the village has to get over over the next year, next two years, next three years, next four years? I guess I have to go back to just keeping response, uh, fiscally responsible so we can survive. Uh, I mean, they, small villages, I mean, there's lots that are disillusioning and amalgamating and we didn't want, we don't want to do that. That was brought up uh quite a few years ago and we just felt that wasn't a fit for us as well as a couple of the other municipalities uh, didn't. So that went by the wayside. Uh, so how do you stop that? And I, I apologize to interrupt because I find that a fascinating because we are seeing some communities heading towards that direction. I know the, I, I think it's the village of Caroline, if I'm not mistaken, please Correct me if I'm wrong here. Anyone who lives in Caroline who's listening to this right now. Um, I think the village and the county of Clearwater County are looking at amalgamation or dissolution into the county. How does the village of Duchess stop that from happening? Is it more growth? Is it more attraction of residents? What do you see as the big thing that you need to do as mayor and council to ensure that issue never sees the light of day in your community again? I guess it's just going to the meetings when, like, when that was happening here. Um, we didn't want to lose our identity, and I know they always bring it up that, uh, I mean, this has happened in many places all, all across Canada, where you're going to save money, you're going to save money, you're going to save money. Uh, we only have two employees in our office and three outside staff. And we, I guess, when when we get a good snowfall, I sometimes jump into one of the pieces of equipment and I go plow the roads while the boys are hauling it. And, the you know, we were worried about if it was taken, if we did amalgamate with the county or the city of Brooks, um, we people wouldn't get the service that they're getting now because after a six inch snowfall, like I say, with me going out there, uh, the last one we had as an example, 
we had six inches of snow and two of the boys, uh, our foreman was on holidays at the time, of course. And the two other employees that we do have outside staff, they started about seven in the morning. I went about 8.30 and by 6.30 I was home and we had all the streets plowed, cleared, and the alleys done as well, and parking lots at the rec center and by our hall and the fire hall. They were all done. So wow. we if if we had amalgamated, I just don't think we could give the services to the people that we have now and keep them at the rates we have. And that's the big thing, right? Keeping rates low and particularly in smaller communities is always hard when you amalgamate into a larger city, which means the services now have to go further to be provided. I want to talk about the role of the, the village and the individual issue. And I want to ask you, as mayor, how do you balance the individual issue with the in, the needs for the community? Because if I go talk to 100 people in your community today and I ask them all what the biggest issue is, they're going to tell me I need a new park in my area. I need my street paved. I need a pothole fixed. I need sidewalks. I need this, that, or the other. Now, you as mayor understand that you have a finite amount of money each year. You cannot spend more than you have. You cannot run a deficit like the provincial government or federal government. So you as mayor and council have to ultimately pick the winners and the losers of the issues that are presented to you in front of you each each year when it comes to budget. How do you see yourself in navigating those micro issues that people have with making sure that they feel like their issue is being resolved and addressed when it comes to getting things upgraded or fixed in your community? That's a good question. Uh, because I, I can imagine you hear about potholes 24-7. Like, especially at this time of year when we're recording this, you're probably hearing about potholes, potholes, potholes. As much as you want to probably not admit it, there's probably potholes that people get upset about. You can't go yeah, fix dude. every single pothole, can you? Well, certain times of the year, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> Other times, you can't. Like we is that called the corner. snow season, Mayor? Is that called the snow season when all the snow packs the bottles down? Fine and freezing. <laughs> uh, but our, our boys are pretty good. Uh, our staff is pretty diligent on, you know, we get cold mix, of course, and we fix them the best we can as they come up. I mean, this year was an exceptional year because of the thawing and freezing and the ice. Uh, I mean, we we don't have any real heavy heavy equipment to uh, like a grader. We don't have. Yeah. Uh, we have smaller equipment, so you just can't bust four inches ice off the roads. I mean, in front of my house, there we had uh, it was about three inches over my sidewalk, and about three feet up my driveway and up my front step uh, up towards my front step. But it's just something that. I think everybody was to the understanding this year it was an exceptional year because it did happen. And we haven't had that happen before because our streets were clean uh, quite diligently, immediately. Uh, our foreman, he gets up at five in the morning and we'll start doing the parking lots and stuff like this. And it's, I don't know. Uh, is it hard to say no to people in your job? Because I can imagine there's probably people who come to you with very bright eyed, great ideas. Like we need a pool. We need this, that, or the other, but you, you have to be the realistic one and burst the bubbles from time to time and say, unfortunately, unless everyone wants to pay an extra thousand dollars a year for taxes, we are not getting that pool or that new facility or that new playground that everyone's been hammering for. Is it hard to say no as mayor? Yes, it is. Uh, we have, we have one, well, we have a, 
a provincial road that runs through the village, a railway avenue. And sometimes it gets to the point where if the lot of heavy traffic comes through it, they're a little noisier. And we have people that have talked about putting a sound barrier up. And it's 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 a half a million or a quarter million dollars to do something like that. And you just I guess I just have to tell them that we can't do it because there's no way that we unless you want your taxes to go up, somebody has to pay for it. And it just it makes it tough because there's the other priorities. Maintaining our streets and our infrastructure is probably our biggest priority. Uh, sewer, water, and things like that. I mean, it's anytime you have to do a sewer line, it and water or a water line, they're deep, so it costs a lot of money, and you have to haul the. When you dig them up, you have to haul all the dirt out and you have to haul it back in because there's just no place to put it. And we've been pretty fortunate that way that um, I think people are pretty happy here. That's good. Because we are, <coughs> excuse me, because uh, our taxes are. Sorry, I'm assuming you were about to say because your taxes are low. I want to turn to my last segment now, and this is this is the fun segment. This is this gets a little bit to know about what I'm about to go do in the village of Duchess when I come and visit in a few weeks. So, Mayor, um, in your opinion, because I have listeners from across Canada and around the world, if I was a tourist to your community, which I am going to be, what are some of the tourist things I should be doing in the village of Duchess when I'm there? And what are the hidden gems that you need people to see while they're in the village? I guess one of our biggest is, is our recreation facility. It is uh, an awesome facility. It's all glass panel around the floor, walking paths in it. Um, and the girl that we had hired to manage it She's a fanatic about keeping it clean all through COVID. They're just, I mean, the floor is, because it's quite big and the cleaner, it takes us about, takes them about two days to get the complete floor done, but that's done on a continuous basis. Um, three Our three parks that we have, one is at the school and the other two, they're all state-of-the-art blue imp uh, facilities and, you know, inspected every year. Oh, wow. Plus our golf course, our uh, Ag Society has a golf course. We have a nine-hole golf course. Are you a golfer? Have, uh, I was when we built it because <laughs> I was uh, very instrumental in building it, helping build it. So if I ask you to go shoot nine holes with me when I'm out in Dutchess, you'll come out with me? Absolutely, I would. I am a hacker, not a golfer. <laughs> I'm, I'm a talker, not a golfer. <laughs> but we have, we have a, I don't know, it's about six, I think it's about 600 seat arena. Oh, wow. We have a two sheet curling rink. We have the largest hall in the county. We can fit over 350 people in it at a time. And of course, our nine hole golf course, which is now grown into a very nice course. I mean, it was quite barren when we first built it, but it's there now. Plus, there's a lot, uh, there's a lot in the county, there's a lot to do. Like we're uh, from Dutchess, it's about 35 minute drive to Dinosaur Provincial Park. Uh, Bizano is about half or about, about 40 minutes away. And it's uh, a dam that was built in 1914, I believe it was, that feeds water to the biggest man made reservoir west of, Lake, uh, west of Winnipeg in the prairies, which is Lake Newell. 
we have an uh, aqueduct just outside of Brooks that was, I think it's just about a mile long, which at one time was the largest aqueduct in the world. Uh, it has been moved, changed over to an earth, earthen uh, one be, just because of the deterioration of it since 1914. And there's a siphon that goes down underneath the railway tracks and comes back up into the aqueduct again. So it's, there is a lot to see in the, in the county, and I know that goes away from Dutch's a little bit, but no, but it's let's close let's, enough that you can, a day trip is very, very simple. So let's end on the million dollar exit question. And this is my, this is the big question for you, Mayor. And you can take as long as you want to answer this, or as short as time as you want to answer this. In your opinion, in your opinion, what makes the village of Duchess such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Uh, it's nice and quiet in Duchess. For the biggest part, uh, you know, there's not usually a lot of parties going on. It's... Uh, like I said previously, it's a bedroom community. So the people that live here, uh, we all know each other. And we just like like living in a quiet community. You don't, not often you hear police sirens going up off. And we don't have, uh, we don't have a lot of uh, crime. And most of the time, like we talked about, it's petty crime. And I think, I don't know, that's, we moved, I moved out here. I moved to Dutchess in uh, 1976 from Brooks. And I would never move back into a, I'd never want to move back into a bigger place because it is quiet. Uh, the children walking down the street, the people walking. Uh, walking their dogs and it's just a nice clean community because that's one thing we pride ourselves on on uh, is uh, keep getting the people to keep their yards clean because we do have an unsightly bylaw and we enforce it or we have it enforced no Tony I want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor to sit down with you for the last 45 minutes and chat with you about your community, about your role as mayor and about the issue that is facing your community. And I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule and, and doing this. It was greatly appreciated. It was my pleasure, Chris, and uh, looking forward to that golf game. So with that, I want to remind everyone, go put down social media for at least 10 minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society, helps our democracy, and it helps us be better people. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, just keep talking.